بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أما بعد فإن أستقى الحديث كتاب الله وأحسن الهدى هدى محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ظلالة وكل ظلالة في النار أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته brothers so um, we'll continue from where we left off inshallah and that is uh, point 52 as you can see here we were halfway through last week's chapter, so we'll continue from where we left off, inshallah. So that's point 52, we'll continue from here. So then, uh, regarding Al-Ihsan, the Shaykh, he says, Qala uh, So just before I continue, uh, this is uh, the Shaykh's um, explaining uh, the Hadith of Jibreel, or the Hadith of Umar, if you remember. We briefly started it last week. So the Shaykh says, Qala, فأخبرني عن الإحسان قال أن تعبد الله سبك أن المحسن هو من هو من يعبد الله على المشاهدة واليقين كأنه يرى الله أو يعبده على المراقبة على المراقبة وهو يعلم أن الله يراه فيحسن العمل لأن الله مطلع عليه فالمحسن يعبد الله إما على المشاهدة في القلب وهذا أكمل وإما على المراقبة وأن وأن يعلم أن الله يراه في أي مكان أو في أي عمل يعمله هذا هو الإحسان. So then in this beginning paragraph, uh, the Sheikh mentions he quotes the original author. He says, um, or oh, he quotes the hadith we're going through, the part of the hadith. I think we're roughly about. Uh, halfway through, he mentions, he says, he said, uh, and this is Jibreel now. So Jibreel said, inform me about al -Ihsan. Inform me about what al is. So then the Prophet wasallam replied and answered. He said, it is that you worship Allah. Yeah. And then the Sheikh mentions here that um, with regards to this statement that you worship Allah, then... Uh, we discussed this. The Sheikh says we, it's been discussed, and that the Muhsin, the one uh, who's uh, Muhsin, uh, he is the one who worships Allah, yeah, upon as if as as if he can see, and upon certainty, like within the heart, right? And it's, it's as if he can see Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, and he's in that state when he's worshiping Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Or the other, the lower form of Ihsan, or the lower level of Ihsan, as you all know, is where the person, when they're worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or they're going about their daily lives, they they know that Allah is watching them. They know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows what they're doing. Yeah, wherever they are, Allah is watching, and He knows what they are doing. So they're in that state. As you remember from last week, the two levels of Al-Ihsan. So then the Shaykh continues and he says, So the Muhsin, the one who's a Muhsin, he worships, uh, he worships Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, upon this criteria as mentioned. Uh, so as if he can see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, although he doesn't see him, is as if he can see him. And uh, and this is more complete, as in it's the first, it's the higher level of al ihsan And then the second level, and then the second level, and so the second level is, or the lower level, is where you are in a state where you know that Allah knows everything you're doing. So for example, uh, we're in this uh, circle of knowledge today. We know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows that we are you know, giving a lesson, we're sharing knowledge, we're learning together as brothers. Allah knows. Yeah. So this is what the Shaykh mentions in this paragraph. So we go on to the next paragraph. Then the Shaykh, he says, that he says, "Qala sadaqt fa akhbirni an saa, ay an qiyam saati mata." 
ولما كان هذا السؤال لا يعلم أحد الجواب عنه إلا الله سبحانه وتعالى لأن قيام الساعة لا يعلم تحديد لا يعلم تحديده إلا الله عز وجل. So let's go back. Then we're following on from the hadith. So the brothers who just joined, we're following on from the hadith of Jibril. Yeah. So Jibril he says to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, you've answered correctly the previous question he asked him. He says Sadaq, you've told the truth. Then Jibreel alayhi salam, he says, inform me about the hour. Yeah, about the hour. You know, the day of judgment. Inform me about the hour. hour. And the Sheikh he gives a further explanation. He says, i.e. about the establishment of the hour or the day of judgment. When is it going to be? This is what it means. Then the Sheikh he mentions here, he says to us, he says, when the question, when this question was asked, or about this question, Nobody at the time knew the answer. Yeah, nobody knows the answer. And we know that nobody knows the answer except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows about the hour. Yeah, when it's going to occur. And the Shaykh says, because the establishment or the establishing of the hour, uh, the, the specifics of it, only Allah azza wa jal knows that. Yeah. So then the Shaykh continues explaining now. He continues, he says, Nahnu na'lam annaha sataqoom sa'a la nashukku fi hadha. Man shakka fi hadha fahuwa kafir. Na'lamu annaha sataqoom sa'a wala wala bud. Walakin, walakin al waqta alladhi taqoomu fihi sa'a. Allah azza wa jal lam yukbirna anhu wa lam bayyannahu lana. Wa واستأثر بعلمه قال تعالى إن الله عنده علم الساعة وقال تعالى يسألونك عن الساعة أيان مرساها قل إنما علمها عند ربي لا لا يجليها لوقتها إلا هو لا يجليها لوقتها إلا هو هو الذي يعلمها سبحانه وقال تعالى وعنده مفاتح الغيب لا يعلمها إلا هو ومنها وقت قيام الساعة. So let's just stop there and translate that so we can carry on following إن شاء الله. So then the Sheikh he says we know that that the hour is going to be established. We all believe this, right? We all know that at some point in the future the hour will come. We just don't know exactly when, yeah? And we don't doubt in the hour. We, none of us doubt in the hour. We all believe in it. The Sheikh says, whoever doubts in the establishment of the hour, then he is a disbeliever, yeah? Because remember, that's from one of the six pillars of Iman, yeah? When we go back to the previous lessons. Then the Sheikh, he says, we know that it's going to, the hour will establish without a doubt. We know it's going to be established. However, the time, the time, for example, that it's going to be established in, then only Allah Azza wa Jal knows this. And he has not, Allah Azza wa Jal, he's not informed us or clarified the exact time when it's going to occur. And we know this by Allah's speech. And, you know, we read these three ayahs as evidence. So if we look at the translation of these ayahs, then inshallah that will clear and clarify it for us as well. So the first ayah is from Surah Luqman verse 34. So if we go there and read the meaning, then Allah Azza wa Jal, he says, Verily uh, well, well, Allah with him alone is the knowledge of the hour. He sends down the rain and knows that which is in the wombs. No person knows what he will earn tomorrow and no person knows in what land he will die. Verily well, Allah is all knower, all aware of things. So that's the whole ayah that we've read. Just particular emphasis on the starting, yeah. So then, the next ayah is from Surah Al-Araf, verse 187. So if we go there and read the translation, they ask you about the hour, day of resurrection. When will be its appointed time? Say, the knowledge thereof is with my Lord alone. None can reveal its time, but He. So, that's focusing on the starting of the ayah as well. So it's becoming clear to us now. And what the Sheikh has explained to us. Then if we go to Surah Al-An'am, verse 59, the final ayah that was quoted, then the meaning 
of that ayah here is, and with him are the keys of the ghayb, all that is hidden. None knows them but he, and he knows whatever there is in or on the earth and in the sea. Well, we'll read the whole ayah. Not a leaf falls, but he knows it. There is not a grain in the darkness of the earth, nor anything fresh or ripe, but is written in a clear record. So that's clear for us, alhamdulillah. So let's continue. So then the shaykh, he says, Qala Jibreel. So we're going back to the hadith now and continuing. So the shaykh says, Qala sallallahu alayhi wa sallam li Jibreel. Mal, mal mas'ul anha bi'ilm min asail. Ayy ana wa ant sawa'an la na'lam mata taqum asa'a. Allah, Allah jalla wa ala lam uh, yattari' ala hadha lal malaika wa lal rusul. Wala ahadan so in this paragraph then this concludes from what the shaykh had mentioned in the book so the prophet sallam, he replies he replies in response to uh, jibril alayhi salam and he says the one who's being asked nor the one who is asking knows about the hour and then the shaykh goes on to explain that that me it means it, it's clear what it means but the shaykh explains further he says that nor the person who's being asked and not the one who's asking knows our that nobody from the creation knows only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows as mentioned in those three ayahs as evidence uh, previously so then we move on to the uh, 53rd point uh, in this chapter so or in the book and we still continue with this chapter so inshallah bear with me so then the shaykh goes on to say he says qala akhbirni an amaratiha al amarat jam wa amara wa hiya al alama so the Shaykh, he says, he says here that he says here that um, that then Jibril alayhi salam in this hadith, he says to the Prophet, he says, inform me about its signs, i.e. about the signs of the hour. And then the Shaykh, he gives us some benefit in terms of the linguistic meaning of the word al-amarat. And he says that, it's the plural of the Arabic word Amara, meaning sign. And then the Shaykh gives us a further benefit. And he says, if you have the Kasra, if you say Al-Imara, then that's to do with Wilaya. So there's a different meaning to it. But the, let's focus on the main meaning here is to do with, or the uh, context is to do with um, signs of the hour. So Jibreel alayhi salam asked the Prophet alayhi salam, what are the signs of the hour? What are its signs? So then the Shaykh goes on to say, says, Akhbirni. عن أماراتها أي العلامات التي تدل على قرب قيامها نعم الساعة لها أمارات وقد بينها الله سبحانه وتعالى منها أمارات أو منها أمارات صغيرة ومنها علامات كبيرة ومنها متوسطة ومنها علامات مقاربة للساعة تكون عند قيام الساعة تكون قريبا من قيامها أَمَّا الْعَلَامَاتَ الْأُخْرَى فَإِنَّهَا مُتَقَدِّمَةَ العلماء يقولون علامات الساعة أو علامات ساعة على ثلاثة أنواع هي علامات صغيرة ومتقدمة وعلامات متوسطة وعلامات كبيرة So then the Shaykh he mentions here he says he goes on to explain what Jibreel says So Jibreel asks the Prophet he says inform me about its signs i.e. It's uh, signs uh, that demonstrate um, it becoming closer. Uh, we're getting closer and closer to the actual hour being established. So the signs of the hour being established. And the Sheikh, he says, yes, about the hour. He says the hour, it has signs. So he clarifies this point. He says that the hour has signs. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has clarified them to us. So he explains these signs. He says, so from these signs are the lesser signs or the minor signs, as we know in English. And then we have the greater signs, yeah, or the bigger signs. And then we have the ones that are in between that. And then we have signs, yeah, uh, that are mentioned, that are particularly are to do with the closeness of the hour. And the Sheikh says this, Sheikh Salih Fawzan Hafizullah. And he goes on to say, and that with these signs, we get as these signs occur one after the other, we get closer and closer to the establishment of the hour itself, the day of judgment. And so then the Shaykh he continues. 
He says, as for the other signs, then they are what have passed, yeah? So what have uh, advanced or have occurred, yeah? And then the Sheikh says that the scholars, they say, he quotes the scholars, he says, the scholars say that the signs of the hour are of three types. They're of three types. And he says they are the lesser signs, yeah, and and and, and many of them, uh, if not, I think all of them have occurred. Correct me if I'm wrong. I think all of this, those signs have occurred. Um, or we're close to that, but correct me if I'm wrong. And um, and then the Sheikh says the alamat mutawasita. He says the the signs that are in the middle, so the ones that are between the lesser signs and the major signs. And then we have the major signs themselves. Yeah, and that is when. Uh, uh, well, the scholars do say that once the one major sign occurs, then they just come one after the other very quickly, and that's when we are very close to the hour. Yeah, the establishment of day of judgment. Yeah, and the hour. So then the Sheikh he continues and he says, "Al alamat al sagira wal alamat al mutawasita kulluha hasalat or hasal muadhamuha." Okay, so the Sheikh answers the question here. My question. So the Sheikh says here that the Small, the lesser signs or the signs that are in the middle, the moderate, the lesser or the moderate signs. Uh, he says that most of them have occurred, or if not, most of them have occurred. So he says that that most of them have occurred. Uh, it says, as for it says, Ammal alamat al kibar, the hur al dajjal, wa nuzul Isa alayhi salam, wa khuruj al daba, wa khuruj yajuj wa majuj, wa fahadhi takun inda kiam saati. Yeah. So the Sheikh says here, as for the greater signs or the major signs of the day of judgment or the hour, then they are, you know, the appearance of the Dajjal, uh, um, the appearance, uh, um, the um, descending of Isa alayhi salam, uh, the coming out of the, uh, the Dabatul Ard, the beast. The beast, yeah, that's going to tread on the earth, and the coming out or the appearance of Ya'juj and Wa Ma'juj, yeah, Ya'juj and Ma'juj. And the Sheikh says that these are from the major signs, and when they do occur, they just come one after the other, and they're in that order that he's mentioned it to us. Hafidullah. So then we move on in the hadith of Jibril. The Sheikh he says, Qala akhbirni an amaratiha, walamma kanat amaratuha. معلومة أجابه الرسول الرسول صلى الله عليه وسلم قال أن تلد الأم أن تلد الأمة ربتها هذا من علامات ساعة الأمة هي المملوكة ورب وربتها سيدتها. So let's stop there because we'll start a new point. So uh, the sheikh he says here. So he's asked. So now uh, Jibril عليه السلام asks the Prophet عليه السلام. He says. In their dialogue, so he says to him, so like some says to him, inform me about its signs, right? As mentioned earlier, the Sheikh gave us a broad answer. So going back to the hadith, the Sheikh says that the Prophet Sallallahu answers him, answers Jibril alayhi salam, and he says that uh, one of the signs he mentions one of the signs is that the uh, when the slave, when the slave or a slave woman, right? Uh, Gives birth to her master, and the master here is being mentioned in the female tense, yeah, in, in in the female, yeah, in the feminine, right. So when the female gives the female as a slave gives birth to her um, owner, so, so so to speak, an owner, and in the owner is in the female tense, yeah, the feminine. So the sheikh he says here he says. And the Sheikh says these are from the signs of the hour. That the um, uh, about this hadith, he will explain. I want to mention this bit here because he's going to explain in more detail uh, uh, shortly. So we'll just hang on. So going on to point fifty-four, the Sheikh says, "Qala sharrah ma'nahu wallahu alam anhu fi akhir zaman yukthar at tasri at yani." يكثر وطع الإماء أي المملوكات فيلد فيلد فيلدنا بنات تكون بنتها حرة حرة 
وتكون سيدتها لأمها ومالكة لها وقيل مأناه أنه يكثر اللقوق فتكون البنت كأنها سيدة لأمها So then here's the explanation So the Sheikh says that uh, the scholars who explain this hadith they say that the meaning they say you know Allah knows best with regards to the meaning they, they begin with this they say Allah knows best with regards to the meaning however what they have gauged from this hadith and the understanding they've taken from it in accordance with the Quran and the Sunnah is that uh, towards the end times um a woman, she'll be a free woman. She'll be a free woman. You know, like how the women are now free women, free men, free women, free women. She'll give birth to a daughter. Of course, it's a daughter, but it'll be as if, as as if that the the free woman, the mother, is enslaved to this daughter. And the sheikh says that this is, for example, like where um, the daughter in this situation. Uh, won't listen to uh, her mother um, will you know override her in and bypass her in everything uh, won't be good to her will tell her what to do and these sort of things yeah so as as if the mom has become a servant yeah this is uh, what some uh, what the meaning has been extracted from from this hadith this is what the sheikh has mentioned to us so then the sheikh continues and he says wa antara al so then the Shaykh continues, he says, Al Hufat, Aladina Laysala Hum Nual Minal Fakar Walf uh Walfaka, Al Urat, Aladina Laysala Hum Libas, Al Ala Al Fukara. So then the Shaykh he says here that and that you'll also see Al Hufat. And he mentions he explains this what these three things are. So he goes on to say that those who don't have like don't have uh, um, shoes, you know, don't have shoes to wear, for example, uh, from their uh, poverty and such. Uh, other, he also says, Al Urat, it's as if the people don't, as, as if they're not wearing any clothes, yeah, or they don't have any clothes. And Al Ala, well, that refers to poverty, yeah, or being poor. These are from the signs as well. So then the Sheikh continues, he says to us, he says, Riyasha. جمع الرأي الذين يرعون أو يرعون الأغنام هؤلاء كانوا في الأصل في البر في البراري في بيوت ينتقلون من محل إلى آخر وفي آخر الزمان يستوطنون في المدن ويبنون القصور والعمارات الشاهقة هذا من علامات الساعة إذا تحولت البداية إلى حاضرة وصاروا يتطاولون في المباني أو أو البنيان ويتباهون بها وينمقونها وهم ليس وهم ليس من عادتهم ويتحولون إلى أغنياء إلى أصحاب ثروة وأصحاب مظاهر هذه من علامات الساعة. So in this paragraph, the sheikh also mentions about you know. Um, uh, the easiest example uh, has been given many times before, and I will use that as well, is um, uh, what we see uh, now, like in the Arab lands in the Middle East, before, you know, they were like Bedouins, uh, all the cared about with the animals, and, you know, they were, uh, for example, like travelers, they were lived in tents, they moved from one place to the next. But now, you can see that what they do is actually not from their culture. So, for example, building tall buildings, and the tallest buildings are within the Middle East, they're competing in building tall buildings, which has actually nothing to do with their culture. Why are they doing it? You know, but anyway, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that all those years ago, and we're seeing this with our own eyes now, the tallest buildings are within the Middle East, as we all know. And this is what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentioned here, where the Sheikh has mentioned to us, that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentioned this, and this is from the signs of the Day of Judgment. So let's carry on. Then the Sheikh, he says, <coughs> excuse me, وكما تعلمون فإن الرسول صلى الله عليه وسلم لا ينطق عن الهوى كما تعلمون الآن كيف حال الناس لقد تغيرت الأحوال وتحول الفقراء إلى أغنياء أصحاب الثروات وتحذرت البادية وبنوا وتطاولوا في البنيان 
وهذا مصداق ما قاله رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم. So then the Sheikh says, and as you know, and as we know, indeed that the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم he does not utter anything from his own desires. Whatever the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said, it was commanded by Allah سبحانه وتعالى, right? In his prophethood. And as we as we know now, what the situation is with the people, by the as the Sheikh he he reiterates that their affairs, as in you know, you know the poor, like as in the Arabs, they were very poor before, very poor, became rich. Allah blessed them, became rich, and then started building and competing in building high tall buildings. And this shows us the truthfulness of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. This is just one sign. It's clear and it's proof. So then the Shaykh continues, point 55. Here, point 55. Qala, thumma kharaja wa labithna maliyan ya'ni waqtan qasira. So then the hadith continues. The Shaykh says, and he said, thumma kharaja wa labithna maliyan ya'ni waqtan qasira. So then Umar sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, uh, Umar radiallahu anhu, he says, and then he left and we remained in our in, in, in where we were within the masjid. We, uh, then he left, I Jibreel left and we remained where we were in the masjid uh, for a short time. So then he goes on to say, the Shaykh said, فَقَالَ النَّبِي صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وسلم, يَا عُمَرْ أَتَدْرِي مَنَ السَّائِلِ مِنَ السَّائِلِ أو من السائل. أو أتدرون من السائل وفي رواية أن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم قال علي بالرجل علي بالرجل فطلبوه فلم يقدروا عليه سدان فلم يقدروا عليه سدان the sheikh he says he quotes he continues with hadith he says that the prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم he said he said يا عمر أو عمر do you know who the questioner was who was the one questioning me the Sheikh says, oh, in another narration, it's uh, narrated like, or oh, in the plural, do you know who the questioner is? The one who's asking the questions. Then the Sheikh continues, he says, قَالَ هَذَا جِبْرِيلَ أَتَاكُمْ يُؤَلِّمُكُمْ أَمْرَ دِينِكُمْ هَذَا الَّذِي دَخَلَ وَسَأَلَ هَذِي الْأَسِلَةِ هُوَ جِبْرِيلَ لَيْهِ السَّلَامِ وَجَاءَ فِي سُورَةِ رَجُلٍ كما وصف لغرد التعليم الحاضرين أمور دي أمور دينهم على طريق السؤال والجواب. So then the Sheikh continues and he mentions the next part of the hadith. He says and he said that the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم he replies and he said this is Jibril who who has come to you to teach the affairs of your deen. And the Sheikh mentions further here he says that the person who entered upon us and upon you and asked these questions, is Jibreel alayhi salam. And he came in the form of a man, and it was described with that, as, as in the uh, start of the hadith, as you are all aware from last week, in order for the intention, and in order to teach the ones who were present, the affairs of their deen, upon the methodology of question and answer. So this is one of the ways of learning. You, you ask questions, and you have answers, question and answer, question. You ask questions and you get an answer. Yeah. So then the Shaykh continues and he says, فَدَلَّ هَذَا الْحَدِيثِ عَلَىٰ مَسَائِلْ أَذِيمَ So we're getting towards the end lesson. I think we've got another maybe 10-15 minutes, inshallah, and we'll finish. Um, let's see. Yeah, we don't have long to go, inshallah. So then the Shaykh, he says, فَدَلَّ هَذَا الْحَدِيثِ عَلَىٰ مَسَائِلْ أَذِيمَ So he says here that, so this hadith, it demonstrates uh, um, uh, it, 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 it um, demonstrates magnificent affairs or situations or great affairs, which he will uh, explain to us, inshallah. And if we look here, we have five, split into five, five affairs, five great affairs. So let's go through them. The Sheikh says, Al-Ula. أن الدين ينقسم إلى ثلاثة مراتب الإسلام والإيمان والإحسان كل مرتبة أعلى من التي قبلها وأن, وأن كل مرتبة لها أركان 
Arkan al-Islam wa Arkan al-Iman wa al-Ihsan rukun wahid. So then he says the first great affair it is that the deen is categorized into three levels as we all know al-Islam and al-Iman and al-Ihsan. Every level that is higher uh, every level is higher than the one that preceded it. So al-Islam is a lower level then al-Iman is higher than al-Islam and then al-Ihsan is at the top and is the highest level. And as we know, all of these, they have pillars. So um, um, al-Islam has pillars, five pillars. Al-Iman, as we all know, has six pillars. The six pillars of Iman. And al-Ihsan, as the Sheikh mentions here, has one pillar, which is explained previously. Then we move on to the second, second affair, major or great affair. Athaniyatu. فيه التعليم بطريق السؤال والجواب وهذه طريقة تعليمية ناجحة لأنها أدعى للانتباه وتلقي العلم كونه يسأل ويتهيأ ذهن ويتطلب الجواب ثم يلقي عليه الجواب وهو يتلع so then the shaykh he goes on to say that the second uh, affair here it is about teaching by way of asking asking a question and receiving an answer question and answer question and answer the shaykh says that this way of teaching is successful it's a successful way because calls to it calls to you paying attention and seeking knowledge and gaining knowledge with uh, from the nature of the point of view that you are asking and then you are you know you're paying attention and you are seeking an answer by way of that question and you're paying attention and you're trying to become more aware of, of the answer and the knowledge and so upon this way of question and answer you reach uh, and gain knowledge and it's more firm in this process you gain knowledge and it's more firm because you gain a better understanding so the sheikh has mentioned here point three the في الحديث دليل على أن من سأل عن علم وهو لا يدري عليه أن يقول الله ورسوله أعلم نعم يأكل العلم إلى عالم إلى عالمه فلا يتكلم بالجواب وهو لا يعرف ويتخرص هذا لا يجوز والرسول صلى الله عليه وسلم لما سئل عن الساعة عن الساعة قال ما المسؤول عنها بأعلم بأعلم من السائل ولما قال للصحابة أتدرون من السائل وهم لا يعرفونه قالوا الله ورسوله أعلم فدل ذلك على أن مسائل الشرع ومسائل الدين لا يجوز التخرص فيها لأن هذا من من التكلف ولكن من كان عنده علم فإنه يجيب ومن ليس عنده علم يقول الله أعلم ومن ومن قال لا أدري فقد أجاب فقد أجاب من قال لا أدري فقد أجاب so then the Sheikh in this paragraph he says the third point he says in this hadith that we had read and the Sheikh had explained to us and its meanings he says that there's evidence here that um, whoever asks regarding knowledge and he does not is whoever's asked regarding knowledge and he does not know that the answer then it is upon him to say Allah and his Rasul know best or Allah knows best. And he leaves the affair of knowledge to the people of knowledge. He leaves that affair. He doesn't jump in and start answering when he doesn't actually know. So he, he should be like this. And then the Sheikh says that the Prophet ﷺ, when he was asked, and this is the Prophet ﷺ, 
when he was asked about the hour, he replied, what did he say in the hadith? He said, the one who's being questioned is not more knowledgeable than the one who's asking it. Uh, uh, and is not more aware of the one who's actually asking it. Meaning that neither the questioner nor the one who's replied knows this. And when the, and when, uh, the Sahaba said, uh, when it was said to the Sahaba, do you know who the questioner is? When they were asked that, and, and obviously they didn't know who it was until the Prophet ﷺ informed them. What did they say? They said, at that time, what did they reply to the Prophet ﷺ? They said, Allahu wa Rasuluhu a'lam. Allah and His Messenger know best. And that was at that time when they said that. Yeah. So this shows you that when the Shaykh says, this shows us that um, uh, the station of uh, knowledge and answering truthfully, and when you don't know, you, sh- you should not answer. And it's okay to say, it's okay, it doesn't take anything away from us. If we don't know something, we just should say, we don't know. And with that, you've answered the question. Because somebody asks you a question, you say, no, end of story, it's done. You haven't tried to answer the question for some reason or another, and then ended up, you know, saying something that's incorrect, for example. And this is what the Sheikh is saying here. <clears throat> and also, remember, we're responsible for what we say. So, we need to pay attention. Then the Shaykh continues, says, قَدْ سُئِلَ الْإِمَامَ مَالِكَ رَحْمَهُ اللَّهِ عَنْ أَرْبَعِينَ مَسْأَلَةً فَأَجَابَ عَنْ سِتْ مِنْهَا وَقَالَ فِي الْبَاقِيَةِ لَا أَدْرِي فَقَالَ لَهُ سَائِلٌ أَنَا جِئْتُ مِنْ كَذَا وَكَذَا وَسَافَرْتُ وَأَتْعَبْتُ وَأَتْعَبْتُ رَاحِلَتِي وَأَتْعَبْتُ رَاحِلَتِي وَتَقُولُ لَا أَدْرِي قَالَ إِرْكَبْ رَاحِلَتَكَ وَذَهَبْ إِلَى الْبَلَدِ الَّذِي جئت منه وقل سألت مالك سألت مالكا فقال لا أدري هذا ليس عيبا أن الإنسان إذا كان لا يعرف الجواب في الأمور الشريعة أنه يقول لا أدري ولو كان عالما الرسول صلى الله عليه وسلم قال ما المسؤول عنها بأعلم من السائل. So then the Sheikh mentions in this uh, paragraph regarding Imam Malik رحمه الله. The Sheikh he says حفظ الله says that Al-Imam Malik, he was asked, may Allah have mercy upon him, he was asked about 40 affairs, 40 affairs, and he only answered six of them. And he said, for the remaining affairs that he did not answer, he said, I don't know. So the one who was asking, he said to him, the, 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 the questioner said to him, I've come from such and such a place, I've traveled, from such a far place and I'm tired uh, and he said this to Al-Imam Malik so then uh, and then he said to Imam Malik he said and then I've done this I've traveled from so, such a such a place far and I'm tired and you're saying I don't know so Imam Al-Imam Malik replied he said ride your uh, your vehicle whether it was a horse or a camel ride what, your riding beast or whatever it was um, and go to the place where you came from and say, and say to the people there and say, I asked Malik and he said, I don't know. And then the Sheikh says that this isn't uh, a point of um, uh, embarrassment. Yeah, it's not anything to be embarrassed about. If you, The Sheikh says, if you don't know and don't have the answer, say, I don't know. It's not a point of embarrassment you shouldn't feel embarrassed about that because if a person you know if he doesn't know an uh, answer and it's the affairs of the of Allah's deen and the sharia then it's better for him he should say he should say I don't know even if he actually is a alim and just doesn't know that particular answer to that question he should still say no just like Al-Imam Malik and the Sheikh says just like the Prophet Sallallahu as well in the example of the hadith where he said that the one who's being questioned uh, uh, doesn't know more than the uh, one who is uh, asking the question, meaning that we both don't know the answer. Well, I, Allah only knows that in that situation regarding that particular question, the hadith. So we can see these examples, and you know, we shouldn't feel embarrassed or we shouldn't feel like you know, uh, you know, uh, we've got uh, 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 you know, deficiencies like that. And you no, know, because at the end of the day, you don't, we shouldn't really, we all of us, including myself as well, we shouldn't. Uh, speak about something with regards to the deen if we don't know about it. 
And it's okay to say no. It's not a problem. So then the Shaykh goes on to say, وَكَانَ صَلَى اللَّهِ وَسَلَّمْ إِذَا سُئِلَ فِي بَعْضِ الْأَسْئِلَةِ وَلَمْ يَكُنْ إِنْدَهُ وَحْيٌ مِنَ اللَّهِ عَزَّ وَجَلْ إِنْتَذَرَ حَتَّى يَنْزِلَ الْوَحْيِ مِنَ اللَّهِ عَزَّ وَجَلْ أَلَسْتُمْ تَقْرَأُونَ يَسْأَلُونَكْ أَنْ كَذَا يَسْأَلُونَكْ أَنْ كَذَا قُلْ كَذَا So then the Shaykh gives an example and he mentions the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam again that when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was asked certain questions and he did not have any answer from the revelation where Allah hadn't revealed that to him just yet he would n- not answer up and he would wait up until Allah had revealed to him and then he would speak so then we have uh, uh, some uh, uh, ayahs that the Shaykh has quoted from Surah Al-Baqarah verse 219 and verse 189 so if we go there and have a look at the uh, meanings uh, here so we should go to 219 first Inshallah. So 219, where the Shaykh says, They ask you, O Muhammad, concerning alcoholic drink and gambling, say, In them is a great sin. Yeah? In them is a great sin. So he stops there. So this is the start of the ayah. And then the other ayah, 189. They ask you, O Muhammad, about the new moons, say, These are signs to mark fixed periods of time. Yeah, fixed periods of time and for the pilgrimage. So then the Shaykh, he continues from here and he says, For Rasul, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Kana ينتظر حتى يسأل غيره أو يبحث عن المسألة في كتب أهل العلم ليتحصل على جواب أما أن يستعجل فهذا فيه خطورة عظيمة وفيه سوء وفيه سوء سوء أدب مع الله عز وجل لأن الذي يجيب يجيب عن شرع الله يقول الله حل كذا أو حرم كذا so then the Shaykh says, and so the Prophet when he was asked uh, and there was no answer, he would wait until Allah had revealed that knowledge to him and then he would answer. Likewise, from what's more appropriate as well is for us. So for us is to, if we don't know the answer, we should ask the people of knowledge who have the answer or try and find the answer from those people, from the people of knowledge, or from the from books, etc. You know, from knowledge, seeking knowledge, um, and to get the answer, and then perhaps we can answer. You shouldn't um, um, be hasty in these affairs uh, because it is a very dangerous situation that you fall into. Why? Because it is having bad manners with Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. It's having bad manners with Allah Zawajal. Why? Because you're answering with regards to the deen of Allah and the law of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And what in se- if, you're ma- if you make a mistake here, for example, if, you, if, you dis- if in the situation you potentially could, uh, what Allah has made halal, you can be making haram. And what Allah has made haram, you could be making halal. And if you fall into that situation, the Shaykh says that that is a very dangerous situation. And why is it a dangerous situation? I like to add a point here that I learned from. Uh, another scholar, Sheikh Abu Zakir Badr, mentions, um, I think it was in the same book, explanation of the same book, or with regards to Aqidah, that, um, uh, and Tawheed and Shirk, that if you make something halal, which Allah has made haram and vice versa, then you are bringing yourself to the same level of Allah. And what does that mean? That means that you are making a rival, you are making yourself a rival to Allah which means that you're entering in the fold of major shirk, which ultimately, as we all know, means that we leave the fold of Islam. So that's why the shaykh here has mentioned it's a very extremely, it's extremely dangerous situation that you could be in. So we need to be uh, uh, sensible and smart about how we uh, uh, go about uh, answering questions, especially when it comes to the deen. You know, it's okay to say no. 
if you don't know and go find out the answer or ask the people of knowledge uh, to gain the answer and there's no harm in that and that's the better way that's what the Sheikh mentions here the fourth mas'ala the fourth affair المسألة الرابعة المسألة الرابعة في الحديث دليل على آداب المتعلم جبريل وهو سيد الملائكة يجلس بين يدي الرسول صلى الله عليه وسلم وهو يسند وهو يسند ركبتيه إلى إلى ركبتي الرسول صلى الله عليه وسلم ويضع يديه على فخذيه يسأل بأدب هذا من أجل أن يعلم الناس كيف يتأدبون كيف يتأدبون مع العلماء. So this is a very important point and it's quite a beautiful point actually. So the Sheikh says in the fourth affair, he says in this hadith there's evidence, yeah, with regards to um, uh, the etiquettes of seeking knowledge and learning. What are they? Where Jibril alayhi salam he Jibreel alayhi salam himself as we know he is the head of all the angels he's the best of them the head of them and he's and in this hadith he is sitting in front of the prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam with his knees touching the prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam's knees his two hands on the thighs on the two thighs of the prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam and this shows us etiquette in seeking knowledge with this beautiful approach and this is in order this the uh, Jibreel Islam did this in order that we as the people when this knowledge reaches us that we know how to how to deal with the people of knowledge how to deal with the scholars and how we should go about uh, approaching them etc as well in this beautiful way you know in a beautiful, friendly, learning approach. Yeah. So, so this is what the Sheikh has mentioned here. Then the Sheikh says, "Hada ba'du ma yadulu alayil hadith wa fihi." So this is some of uh, um, what the, uh, the hadith points towards as well. So he says the fifth affair. He says, "Masalat uh, khamisatun wa hiya bayan ba'du alamat saa dhikru alamatain an talid al ama rabbataha." وبعض العلماء يقول معنى أن تلد الأمة ربتها أنه يكثر يكثر الأقوق في آخر الزمان حتى تصبح البنت كأنها سيدة على والدتها تأمرها وتنهاها وتغلظ عليها. So the last paragraph here in this page is where the sheikh mentions here. He says the fifth affair and he says to us. And it is some of uh, some of the signs of the hour, or clarifying some of the signs of the hour. So, two of two of those signs were mentioned, right? About the uh, about the mother uh, giving birth to her master, as in the, uh, in, in the in the feminine tense. So, her daughter, for example, in this situation, the scholars say, where the sheikh has reiterated to us, it means that where, for example, the daughter. Uh, uh, is basically overriding her mother. Her mother will say something, she will do something else. Uh, she will also uh, not listen to her mother. She will force her mother to do things. She will prevent her mother to do things uh, and uh, these kind of things. So in essence, she becomes like the owner of her mother. She becomes the chief. Right? And we know that that's not the way it should be. And also that um, uh, she will be severe upon her mother. So these are all bad qualities. And, and you know, I'm sure we've all heard stories uh, uh, and maybe experienced this firsthand even, you know, um, about these situations happening. And this is one of the signs uh, of the Day of Judgment, uh, as the Sheikh mentioned. So then the Sheikh says, so we move on to the point, uh, point 56, and we'll stop here, alhamdulillah, jazakallah khair, for staying with me. So... We'll stop here at point 56. Why? Because we move on to a, no, a new part of this book now. So we've completed the first part. Alhamdulillah, we've got there. And uh, that's a major milestone for his brothers. So the next next week, we'll be going through what the Sheikh mentions here. Al-Aslu Thalith Ma'rifatun Nabiyyina Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Ismuhu wa nasabuhu wa nash'atuhu So we're going to now move on 
to the about the and learn about the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We're going to learn about the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, his name, you know, his lineage, and his upbringing, and etc. So we'll stop here, inshallah, and uh, we'll continue from where we've left off, point fifty six, inshallah, next week, same time. Barakallahu feekum. Astaghfir. Subhanakallahu wa bihamdik. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa anta. Astaghfiruka wa tubilaik. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.